Brilliant.org is one of the best ways to interactively learn computer science, math, and physics. There's thousands of lessons from computational biology to the history of mathematics to data science, neural networks, and more, with new lessons being added every month. I found the computer science courses to be quite useful in helping me nail down those fundamentals in an interactive way, such as in the tutorials on computational problem solving. The lessons on Brilliant are an excellent tool for lifelong learning and keeping your skills sharp in today's digital world. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash faculty of con or click on the link in the description below. The first 200 of you that sign up will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Greetings students and welcome back to another lesson on partial differential equations. In this video, we're going to solve PDEs with time-varying boundary conditions using the Laplace transform and introduce something called the Duhamel's principle. Suppose I have a rod of length L, and at the right end of the rod, I attach a heat source that would change the temperature of the right end in a manner governed by the function f of t. The left end of the rod, meanwhile, has a temperature of zero. In addition, the top and bottom of the rod are insulated such that heat can only flow in the horizontal direction. And finally, the initial temperature of the rod is zero throughout. If the temperature of the rod as a function of time were described by the multivariable function u of x comma t, then the PDE problem governing this temperature could be described using the following differential equation, which is really just the heat equation for u. Alongside this heat equation, you have two boundary conditions, which I'll call BCs, the abbreviation. One boundary condition is for the left end of the rod where u is zero, and the other boundary condition is for the right end of the rod where u is f of t. Finally, the initial condition, or ic, corresponding to this problem just states that u is zero at time zero, so that's going to be our initial condition. I'm now going to start two branches to this PDE problem. In one branch, I'll solve a simplified version of this problem where I'll assume that f of t is just one. In the other branch, I'll solve this problem for the general case where f of t is some arbitrary function, f of t. I've shown you in a previous video how to solve the PDE for a situation that the temperature on the right side is maintained at a constant of 1. You construct a solution consisting of a steady state solution solved by setting the time derivative in the PDE to 0, plus a transient solution solved by setting both the boundary conditions to zero since the steady state solution already obeys the non-zero boundary conditions. I've covered this in detail previously and I've linked the relevant video in the description. However, I'm not going to be using that technique in this video. Instead, I'll be using Laplace transforms to solve this branch of the PDE problem. The reason for this is that when I start solving the branch where f of t is arbitrary, it's easier and more natural to use Laplace transforms to create a solution from Duhamel's principle. But before applying Laplace transforms, let's briefly recall what they are. Laplace transforms are integral transforms that transform a function f of t into a function of another variable, capital F of s, via the following integral relation. Because the limits of this integral are zero and infinity, the variable we're transforming into s via the Laplace transform must be one that goes from zero to infinity. In this PDE problem, x is restricted to lie between 0 and l, so we cannot transform with respect to x, which means that we can only transform with respect to t. So if we take the Laplace transform of this PDE with respect to time, we end up with s times capital U minus u at t equals 0 equals the second ordinary derivative of capital U with respect to x. I've used the subscript SMP on capital U here to denote the fact that we're solving a simpler version of our PDE problem by setting a constant boundary condition. The boundary conditions would then just get transformed to U sub SMP at x equals 0 equals 0, and U sub SMP at x equals L equals 1 over S. We can get rid of the U at the t equals 0 term just because that's 0 according to our initial condition, leaving us with the following Laplace transformed PDE problem. If I solve the second order ODE on the Laplace transform capital U sub SMP, I'll get the sum of a positive and negative exponential with a coefficient of square root of s inside the power. The a and b are constants, by the way, that can be found using the boundary conditions. And so let's apply those boundary conditions to find a and b. At x equals 0, capital U sub SMP is 0, so substituting that in gives us the following. 
Now at x equals zero, both the exponentials are just one, so that means a plus b is zero. Now for our second boundary condition, capital U sub simp is one over s when x is l, so our equation becomes the following. Note that I've replaced b by negative a from the first boundary condition and I've taken the a common already. And I've done this for a reason because if you recall your hyperbolic trigonometric identities, this expression in the brackets very strongly resembles the definition of the hyperbolic sine or cinch. Recall that hyperbolic sine is e to the x minus e to the negative x over two. So the expression in the brackets is just two times the hyperbolic sine of l square root of s. Therefore, a is just one over two s times the hyperbolic sine of l times the square root of s. If we plug this into the equation for capital U, this is what we end up with. Once again, the term in the brackets is directly related to the hyperbolic sine function. Specifically, it's equal to two times the hyperbolic sine of square root of s times x. And if we make the substitution, this is the final answer we get for capital U sub SMP of x. Note that the twos have canceled out here from the numerator and denominator. Now, this is where we take the inverse Laplace transform. Unfortunately, this is a pretty complicated expression, so it's really hard to find the inverse transform analytically, which means you'll pretty much have to take my word for it when I say that the inverse transform of this is given by the following. By the way, if you don't like this huge leap of faith where I magically arrived at this function, you can watch my previous video on non-homogeneous boundary conditions, which I mentioned earlier on, links in the description. If you watch that video, you'll see that you don't have to use Laplace transforms for the simpler PDE problem. You can, but the other video shows you a different, more rigorous technique. So this is where we start using Duhamel's principle. From this solution to the more simple PDE problem, U sub SMP, we can actually derive the solution for the PDE problem where one of our boundary conditions is an arbitrary function of time as opposed to just being a constant one. We'll start off with the same method, using Laplace transforms with respect to time. Just like before, our differential equation becomes a second order ODE in x, but our boundary conditions are a bit different, since the boundary condition at x equals l becomes capital F of s, which is the Laplace transform of f of t. Again, the initial condition is zero, so we can eliminate that. And once again, the solution to the differential equation here is the same sum of exponentials. We'll apply our first boundary condition at x equals zero to find that a plus b is zero once again. Then we'll apply our second boundary condition at x equals l to obtain the following. Converting the bracket term to a term involving the hyperbolic sine and isolating capital A gives us the following. Let's now plug this into our expression for capital U and if we do that we'll get u of x equals capital F of s times the hyperbolic sine of x times the square root of s divided by the hyperbolic sine of L times the square root of S. Now we wanna to get to a point where the inverse Laplace transform of capital U incorporates the inverse Laplace transform of the simpler U sub SMP. And in order to do this, we'll multiply and divide by the expression for U by S. And this is just S times capital F of S times U sub SMP. Now, if you recall from Laplace transforms, you'll remember that the Laplace transform for the first derivative of a function with respect to time, such as u sub SMP, is S times the Laplace transform of u sub SMP, which is capital U sub SMP, minus the initial condition on u sub SMP, which is really just zero. Therefore, this product of S times capital U sub SMP and the expression for u of x are just the Laplace transform of the partial of u sub SMP with respect to time. However, capital F of S can also be written as the Laplace transform of F of T, which if you recall, is our time varying boundary condition that made our problem more complicated. So capital U of X is essentially the product of two Laplace transforms, the Laplace of F of T and the Laplace of the partial derivative of U sub SMP with respect to time. And this is where we can finally take our inverse Laplace transform. Now the inverse Laplace of capital U is u of x comma t, the function we want to find. And on the right hand side, we've got the inverse Laplace of the product of two Laplace transforms. Now, does this product of two Laplace transforms ring a bell? Think about it for a second. It should, because it all ties into the convolution theorem. The Laplace transform of the convolution of two functions of time, g1 and g2, is the product of their individual Laplace transforms, for t going from zero to infinity. 
So here in our equation for u, we've got the product of two Laplace transforms. This means that the inverse Laplace is then the convolution of the original functions. And by the definition of convolution, we can write the convolution of f in this partial derivative with respect to t as the following integral. Now, in my convolution video, you may recall that I use negative infinity and infinity as the limits of the integral. But when your variable t is only valid from zero to infinity, you're actually just allowed to ignore the negative half and write the convolution integral like this. So just in case you feel there's an inconsistency, this is the explanation. We can further simplify this integral by using integration by parts. So I'll designate f of tau as my first function and this partial with respect to t of u sub smp as my second function. So I've got the first function times the integral of the second with the limits zero to t applied on the whole thing and then minus the integral from zero to t of the integral of the second function times the derivative of the first. Now the integral over tau of partial u sub smp partial t, which is a function of x and t minus tau, is actually just negative u sub smp of x and t minus tau. The integral of the derivative of u sub smp gives you u sub smp, and the negative comes out because we're integrating with respect to tau, and u sub smp is a function of t minus tau. If you don't believe me, you can use a variable substitution and call theta t minus tau and then perform your integration accordingly. Anyway, if we use that rule, u simplifies to the following. If we now apply the limits here, we'll get negative f of t times u sub smp at x comma zero plus f of zero times u sub smp at x comma t. Once again, the initial condition on u sub smp is zero, so the first part cancels. And so finally, we find that u of x comma t, the solution to this PDE problem alpha with the time dependent boundary condition is given by the following where u sub smp, which I'll copy paste here, is the solution to the simpler PDE problem where f of t was just one. And this is a demonstration of Duhamel's principle. I can find the solution to a PDE problem with a non-homogeneous, a time-varying boundary condition using the solution to a simpler PDE problem with a constant boundary condition. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. And if you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.